Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Molly Wolazen, and I'm with NOAA's National Integrated Drought Information System. So I'll be moderating the session today, and also it appears as though maybe presenting the last presentation because unfortunately the presenter is at jury duty this week. Um, so today's session will be focused on drought and human health, and so we have five different presentations and we'll have some time for Q&A and discussion as well. Um, so to kick us off, we have Dr. Jesse Bell. And Dr. Jesse Bell is the Claire M. Hubbard Professor of Water, Climate, and Health at the University of Nebraska Medical Center and the School of Natural Resources at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. He's also the director of the Water, Climate, and Health Program at UNMC and the University of Nebraska Nebraska's Dougherty Water for Food Global Institute. His expertise and research are focused on understanding the impacts of changes in the environment and climate on natural and human processes. Dr. Bell is a native Nebraskan and received his PhD from the University of Oklahoma. So would you like to come up here and start your presentation? All right. Thanks, Molly. Um, and thank you for everybody being here today. really appreciate it. Uh, so I'm going to talk very broadly about the impacts of drought on human health, and then we're going to hear a little bit more in depth on uh, different areas around this as well. And so just to kind of kick it off, uh, if you've ever seen a presentation by me, and I talk about drought and health quite a bit because this is a big area that I focus on, one of the first things I always talk about is the significance of drought. A lot of times we overlook the significance of drought, especially in the context of human health. I put this quote up here because I think it kind of signifies that quite well. Floods kill people, but droughts destroy civilizations. I always wish that I could find the U.S. government official that said this. I was at a drought meeting years ago, and when she mentioned this, I, I thought it just quantified, it signified the importance of drought when we talk about the impacts on society. But it also catches one particular piece in there. It said floods kill people, but one of the things that I want to talk about is the potential impacts on human health. And hopefully by the end of this presentation, you'll understand some of those impacts and see some of those potential relationships. But when we talk about drought and the impact that drought has had on society, you can look at the collapse of some societies uh, historically that have been t potentially attributed to drought. You can see the potential historical significance of drought on society as well. Here in the United States, in the central part of the United States, we're definitely not um, outside that, that realm of impacts on drought. This is actually, it changed our history. And so we have the Dust Bowl of the 1930s. Many people are familiar with that Dust Bowl. It was uh, at the same time, a major significant drought hit this part of the United States. It had economic impacts that were widespread throughout this region, and it led to large dust storms and also displacement of populations. And so I'm going to try to connect how we get from a drought event to human health. So internationally, over the last century, drought has likely killed more people than any other climate or weather-related disasters. Floods have likely impacted more people, but droughts have likely killed more people, and that's because of famine and malnutrition. But in the United States, there's been very little work done to establish whether or not droughts have impacts on human health. Here in the United States, it's actually heat waves are likely the leading cause of death compared to all other climate and weather related disasters, exceeding even tornadoes and severe storms and tropical hurricanes. But droughts have a significant financial impact. And so one of the things that you'll see over the time frame, uh, this exact same time frame, is that we see that droughts are number two in terms of billion dollar disasters, the total economic cost associated with these types of events. And we've seen a number of very significant droughts in the United States. There have been $30 billion disasters, climate and weather related disasters that are droughts. Uh, these are disasters that exceeded a billion dollars of economic loss. There's been 30 of them over the last 40 plus years. 
They've led to over $300 billion of economic loss just in, in the United States. They've pretty much hit every state in the U.S. in some capacity. And there's also over 4,000 deaths that have been attributed to these 30 droughts that have hit the U.S. Now, those uh, 4,000 deaths are because of heat waves. And so the association between heat and drought. But that's just one pathway that drought can potentially impact human health. And there's a variety of other pathways, but drought is really hard to understand some of these relationships between how we get from a drought event to human health outcomes. Droughts can evolve more slowly, especially compared to other natural disasters. Their impacts are not immediate. Uh, they require some kind of intermediate, indirect step. And they can require multiple outcomes, or uh, require multiple steps before you actually see a human health outcome. And then health surveillance is not designed to monitor health impacts associated with drought. And so when we have a drought event, some hospital or uh, mortuary or whatever is not out there saying, well, this person died because of this drought event. And so it requires a little bit more complex analysis to understand some of these relationships. And you're going to hear about some of that with uh, some of the other presenters. And so I put this pathway up, and Dr. Abadi was the one that actually made this, um, to show that relationship between drought and human health. And so in the blue box over on the side, that's the drought event itself. And then you have the exposure pathway. That's the change in environment. That's that intermediate step that you have. And then followed by the health outcomes. These are the things that happen that are associated with the drought event, uh, that associated with that change in environment. I put up the social and behavioral context, the blue box on the bottom, and the environmental institutional context, the, the brown box up at the top, because those are the things that influence the health outcomes that occur. A drought in the way that it manifests in one country or one part of the world or one part of the United States versus another part of the United States is going to be different. The health outcomes are going to be different because of those changes in the social and behavioral context and the environmental institutional context. So social and behavioral is the uh, social determinants of health. The occupation is an agricultural region. What kind of agriculture? What is the infrastructure? And then um, the environmental and institutional context is what is the water supply? What is the physical environment and agricultural environment that those people live in? And that influences that pathway. And we've done work, uh, there's been work shown that here in the United States, we see a change in mortality associated with drought events. Uh, a colleague of mine, Jesse Berman, published an article a couple years ago showing that there was an increase and mortality, especially in the western part of the United States, with adults older than 65 years of age. Dr. Abadi published a work, uh, was that two years ago? Last year. Last year that showed an increase in mortality in Nebraska associated with drought events over the last 40 years. And that was in particular with individuals between 45 and 65 years of age. But that doesn't get at what is actually causing that change in mortality. A drought event doesn't occur and then people die, something isn't changing, like I said, in the environment. And there's a variety of different pathways for that. One, compromise of water quality and quantity. There's a study that was done, I believe it was last year or two years ago, that showed an increase in arsenic in uh, groundwater across the United States under drought events. We also know that there's a reduction in water availability and other pathways to reduction in water quality as well. And so this is unpublished work. This is uh, a project that we're, we're currently working on where we see an increase in respiratory-related mortality in the United States associated with drought events. And everything that's in red that I have circled, that is where we see an increase in mortality associated with respiratory-related mortality associated with drought events over the last 20, around 20 years. And so the next step is we wanted to understand what are some of those relationships. So we just see that there's a change in respiratory-related mortality, but we don't understand what are the potential, who are the individuals that are impacted. And so one of the things that we've seen is that in non-metro rural areas, 
we see a, a more significant relationship with an increase in respiratory-related mortality with very or more severe drought event compared to metro, even though with metro we also see an increase as well. So I'm going to summarize. Hopefully I didn't go too long. Um, drought has a significant impacts on society, especially here in the United States. Drought is associated with health of, uh, impacts internationally and within the U.S. There's opportunities to use this data to better understand and evaluate the impacts of drought because there's still a lot that we don't understand so that we can communicate to public health officials. And we need to develop tools for public health officials to understand some of this information. And you're going to hopefully hear about some of those tools coming up as well. And then we need to understand what's going on here in the United States, but there's an opportunity to extend this work internationally as well. And I hope that throughout this conference we can see opportunities for that. And so with that, I want to acknowledge and thank all of our uh, team members and people that have been associated with this. Also, some of our funders with NASA, uh, NOAA, and then the Clarem Hubbard Foundation. And uh, if you're interested in our work, please uh, follow us on the, uh, for the water, uh, water Climate and Health Program and also through Water for Food. So with that, thank you. Thank you. Just stay here. We have time for just a couple of questions. Does anyone have a question? Oh, Mark, go ahead. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, quick question. As you know, impact testing and other areas of drought, do you see a better opportunity in the health field given is there a little clarity in the state of both hospitals and community centers and things of that nature, CDC compared to the other traditional drought impact areas? Yeah, that's a great question, Mark. And, and th that's a complicated one. For us, just getting the health data has been a real challenge. And so, and that's, you know, and, and here in the United States, we have, uh, you know, very advanced systems for monitoring human health. But within that, there is limitations. And access to data has been a major limitation. If we could get better access to data around some of these related issues, it would help us better understand what populations are potentially exposed. Right now, we're looking at mortality. But mortality is not the best indicator of human health impact. Hospitalization records are the best indicator. Mortality is obviously is usually much smaller percentage of the population. That's always one of my challenges whenever we see like a natural disaster occur and somebody says, well, there were three deaths associated with it. The health impacts are much bigger and most likely the, the, the mortality impacts are much bigger as well. Um, and so I think with some of the connections that we have through CDC right now for accessing health data and some of the ones that we're trying to build, especially you know, now in Nebraska, we have an environmental public health tracking program in the state uh, that we're working with the state to help develop. I'm hoping this will help us get some better access to data to better understand some of these health relationships. Uh, Mark, did I answer your question? Or? Yeah. Okay. It's an access issue, yeah. It, but we have the, you know, it, we have the techniques to understand some of these relationships, and it's taken a while to undertake to develop some of these techniques. Epidemiologically, it's hard to understand the relationship between drought and human health because it manifests slowly. It's just different than any of these other climate and weather related. Well, not all, but many climate and weather related disasters, and so it can take days, weeks, months, or even years for the health impacts to manifest. And because of that, you have to be creative in how you do the epidemiological study. Any other oh. questions? Sorry. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Actually, you know what? Your hand is up, really. Why don't we go? Oh, People okay. <laughs> save your questions. Yeah. <laughs> uh, thanks. I would say yes, and I'll, 
And yeah, and it, it'll go. We'll go right into Dr. Obadi's talk, who do an excellent job talking about some of the work that she's focused on. And we've done other studies as well, looking at increase in. Did you talk about the Berman study in your NL? Okay, all right, all right. Well, I'll let Dr. Abadi address that <laughs> with the next presentation. I think she does an excellent job showing some of those relationships. But yes, 100%, I think that is a big thing. And we've seen that in other places as well. Cross one table. Yeah, you might have to oh. loop on to okay. that and okay. then just save your question. We'll have some time at the end. So thank you again, Jesse. All right, so that was a good segue into our next uh, presenter. So Dr. Abadi is an assistant professor at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. She is cross-trained in climatology, meteorology, and environmental epidemiology. Her current projects use, involve the use of statistical modeling, data management, and machine learning techniques to improve our understanding of how environmental exposure, such as drought and heat waves, is affecting communities. The ultimate goal of her research is to help improve the allocation of public resources and public health messaging systems to minimize adverse health outcomes driven by climate and weather related events. So I'm looking forward to hearing your presentation. Good morning, everyone, and um, thank you for being here for this session. Um, Thank you, Molly, for the introduction. So I'm going to specifically talk about drought and mental health and specifically suicide. So some of the slides that I have is summarizing what Dr. Bell was talking about, uh, generally about drought and health effects. So uh, according to uh, World Meteorological Organization, uh, droughts are the leading cause of death from the world's worst disasters in the last 50 years. Drought cause uh, severe social and financial disruption, which uh, leads to uh, malnutrition, food security, with the death of livestock, and eventually uh, it has an impact on the people and cause death and illness. Uh, this is an image from the billion dollar disasters, and as you can see, the frequency of the drought in the United States has been increasing, and you can see the, the cost associated with that over the years has been increasing as well. Um, as of the, um, the total loss in, in, in terms of money, drought is uh, following severe storms and um, tropical cyclones. And uh, when it comes to mortality, drought is actually number two uh, following the tropical cyclones. But as Dr. Mel, uh, Dr. Bell mentioned in his, uh, in his presentation, um, the health issues related to drought or mortality is usually underestimated because this is just showing the heat-related um, illness and mortality uh, in the United States. So this is a chart showing the impacts of uh, drought on the health outcomes. You can see different pathways through wildfires, water quality, water quantity, heat waves, uh, change in the vector habitat, and then also food security, dust storms, those are the physical changes in the environment that will lead to human health issues. Uh, and it has a broad range of allergy-related illnesses, injuries, gastro and, and, and uh, so many other health issues, and including mental health. So drought has impact both on physical health and mental health. Suicide is another big issue <laughs> in the US, and uh, it has been increasing. The plot on the, on the right shows that it has been increasing over time, and also uh, firearm suicide has been on the rise, and you can see on the left um, chart that, specifically in the, uh, in the rural areas, and specifically in the firearm suicide. Almost half of the suicides are done through firearms, and um, yeah, but both of them uh, are increasing in urban and rural areas. There are major risk factors for suicide. If you go through the literature, you can see, for example, prior suicide attempt, relationship issues, marriage issues, access to lethal means, lack of access to behavioral health care, specifically in the rural areas, and also chronic disease and disability. But when we talk about suicide, weather is usually not discussed as a risk factor. Uh, there are prior research, uh, um, specifically in, uh, in developing countries, and um, most of the time in Australian communities as well, talking about drought and, and health and mental health. 
There is no uh, major study in the U.S. Uh, talking about drought and suicide. We've had uh, on uh, drought and mental stress in the farm, like in the farming communities that Dr. Bell mentioned. Uh, one of our colleagues, Jesse Berman, talked about uh, the increased occupational psychological stress among U.S. farmers uh, in the time of droughts. And also there have been studies in California talking about uh, crime increasing the uh, property crimes during the drought. This is a pathway that Dr. Bell was a co-author on, on this research that came out in 2015 showing a pathways from drought to uh, suicide. And the major components uh, that were included in that research was the migration, displacement, and also the financial stress. But the pathways is not um, very well understood in the United States. Uh, assessing drought is a challenge because it's a, um, the, the health impacts are not direct. Uh, it's usually a compound event with the heat wave, with air pollution. So it's very difficult to uh, actually you know, like assess the health impacts of drought. It's a slow onset phenomenon. It's a creeping uh, phenomenon. And also uh, it, drought normally pulled and other natural hazards as of geog uh, ge geographical extension is higher than other, you know, like acute events like flooding or, uh, or even heat waves. So for, I'm going to uh, switch to this specific study that we have done in the U.S. When we talk about drought, we are talking about different types of drought. So if you're talking about a lack of precipitation for a short amount of time, we have uh, the meteorological drought, which has an impact on the surface. And then when the drought uh, like, uh, persists longer, it will affect the soil water deficit, so we'll go to agricultural drought, and beyond that, it will, it will have an impact on the groundwater deficit, so the hydrological drought, and anything beyond that starts to have an impact on environment, economy, society, and we call it soci uh, socioeconomic drought. Uh, for this specific study, we wanted to talk about both duration and severity of drought, so we kind of merged two different drought indices, one talking about different time scales as a proxy for short-term drought versus longer-term drought, and also with different categories of drought. Uh, most of you are probably familiar with that. This is the US drought monitor product showing the um, severity of the drought during time. And I think this one is uh, for a county in Nebraska. But it shows the categories uh, on the left with abnormally dry to exceptional drought. And then we also um, talked about this one, oops. So, and also we talked, uh, we used the evaporative demand drought index. So how we defined drought was uh, more than two months, consecutive months in, in a drought event for a specific location uh, as a time series. And then we calculated the cumulative drought severity index. And then we kind of split the drought event to worsening part at the beginning and improving part at the end. And uh, the purpose was to show that the impacts at the beginning of the drought, uh, still having that moderate drought, is different from uh, the moderate, uh, moderate drought at the end of the drought with having all those cumulative stress during that event uh, period. And then also we uh, split the, 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 the worsening part to two different parts of moderate drought versus severe. And then... Uh, in the improving part of the drought, we have that severe at the beginning and then moderate drought at the end. So for each drought event, we had four stages of moderate, severe, but in the first half, moderate, severe, in the second half, which is improving. And then for the mortality data, uh, that was from CDC, from a National Center for Health Statistics. We extracted the firearm, non-firearm suicide mortality and uh, we split the data to four age categories of 0 to 19, 20 to 39, 40 to 64, and above 65. We had three different races of white, other, and black, and we had two sex categories of male and female. So this is the main result for the total population, and uh, that's going through over the period of the drought, starting from the moderate, going to severe in the beginning of half of the drought, and then going to the uh, moderate at the end of the drought. What we noticed was for the firearm, it has a higher association with drought. The, the firearm suicide had a higher association with the drought, specifically in the severe part of the drought. And then, uh, so the top shows the association. The bottom plot shows the population attribution fraction, which shows the public health burden. 
Um, and then we also noticed that, uh, as you can see, in the severe drought, in the firearm suicide, in the left category, we see that the higher association in the beginning half of the drought, which for non-firearm, it was shifted to the improving part. So, and we hypothesize that this is because of the lethality of the firearm. For example, for non-firearm, it probably, you know, like, there are multiple attempts involved. They might not, you know, like, uh, be successful in the first time, and, you know, like, it might uh, be, like, more cumulative stress during the drought. And then, and then we had the stratification based on age, uh, we had sex, race, and uh, urbanicity for that. And we noticed that the association was higher in the younger population, 20, younger adults, 20 to 39, and above 65, an older population. And also the association was higher in female, the association was higher in the black community, and also the association was higher in the uh, rural areas. But then when we, uh, and the association was all higher for the firearm compared, uh, compared to non-firearm. When we talk about the public health burden, because uh, this PAF uh, considers the prevalence of the disease, so we know that men commit more suicide compared to women. So when we consider that prevalence of the disease in a certain category or certain population, we see that um, we see higher uh, percentage of suicide in between 40 to 64, and also in male, which we'll hypothesize that we'll see more, uh, in white population and in metro uh, versus non-metro. But for non-firearm, there were not uh, much of a difference between metro and non-metro. So in, uh, in to summarize the result of this study, we showed that longer term droughts showed a higher association uh, with suicide compared to shorter term droughts. And also, um, we showed that there is an inverse or inverted U shape uh, where we see lower association at the beginning of the drought. Going to the middle of the drought, we see higher association and it kind of, you know, like decline again in the improving section of the drought. And, um, and also we, show, we, uh, we saw that, uh, going back to this one, we also we saw that the higher association with the firearm suicide in the beginning of the drought for non-firearm suicide, we saw that shift toward the improving uh, side of the drought. And when we talk about the public health burden of the suicide in the, in the drought period, uh, the more vulnerable population were the middle-aged group, 40 to uh, 64, and uh, we saw higher effects in males, white population, and uh, the firearm was higher than non-firearm. With that, um, thing, that was the end of my presentation. Well, thank you for listening. Any questions? Yes, go ahead. So the question was, did you have an association with occupation um, for this research? Yes, thank you for that question. We know the occupation matters a lot when it comes to suicide. Unfortunately, we didn't have that information in our data. But uh, this is the ongoing research, and we have had some. Uh, we have found some proxy to include that, you know, like for example, agricultural fisheries, those type of information in the data. Thank you. Thank you again so much. And if you have other questions for Dr. Abadi, we will have some time at the end. Uh, so our next speaker will speak on the perspective of drought's impact on human health from the lens of agriculture. Um, so we have Bobby Chris Wickman, and she is the Public Affairs and Outreach Coordinator for USDA's Farm Service Agency in Nebraska, a role that she's held for the past seven years. Bobby has over 20 years of service to the Nebraska agriculture industry. Prior to her time at F FSA, she was with the State of Nebraska Department of Agriculture, where she served as the department's policy analyst and later as its assistant director. She is a native of South Dakota and a graduate of South Dakota State University with degrees in journalism and political science. So with that, I'll turn it over to you. Here, I'll let you get situated. <laughs> All right.
right. Good morning, everyone. So I was asked to talk a little bit about um, mental health and the policies that we have in place uh, through the federal government here to help our producers deal with the stresses that come um, by helping them financially keep their operations uh, going during times of drought. So a little bit about Farm Service Agency for those who maybe don't know what we are or who we are. Um, we are part of the United States Department of Agriculture. There's a lot of different agencies underneath that big USDA umbrella. Um, we work to help producers uh, financially through uh, economic assistance programs, disaster assistance programs. We have farm loans, so from a credit standpoint. Um, and then we also have conservation programming that we implement through uh, Farm Service Agency. Um, we've been around since the 1930s, um, so to Dr. Bell's presentation talking about the Dust Bowl, um, that's kind of when USDA was, when FSA was born as a part of USDA. So we've been around working on um, farm programs for a long time in one form or the other. Um, most of our programs are implemented through the Farm Bill, which is legislation that is renewed every four or five years, and in fact is being worked on right now. I just wanted to show you our footprint. So this is the Nebraska footprint, every blue and green county. Um, and every county that's blue or green has an office, a local office. So we are in the rural areas that we serve. Um, the counties that are in white don't necessarily have an office, but would be served by the closest office. Um, we, so we have 71 offices across the state. Um, Farm Service Agency as um, a product of the United States Department of Agriculture has a footprint in every state, so you're going to see something similar in every state in, in the United States. Um, there's about 21 offices, uh, 20, 21, 2,100 offices total across the nation and about uh, 10,000 employees. We have about 400 of those here in Nebraska. So when we talk about um, drought and the programs that we implement at Farm Service Agency, this tool becomes um, something that we uh, consider and look at regularly because it triggers um, most of our main programs that we implement through Farm Service Agency to help our producers. So it's a very important tool for us and something that we pay attention and, um, to as well as our producers that we serve. Um, Three of the main programs that I'm going to talk about in a little bit are triggered by uh, the United States Drought Monitor. And you can see Nebraska on the right. Um, that was uh, from April 27th, so there's been a new one since then. But we are not in a good position this year uh, starting out our growing season. And so we're already implementing a number of programs in Nebraska to help our producers. So this is a little bit of the alphabet soup of programs that we have and that our producers uh, can access depending on uh, the program qualifiers. Um, you know, the top uh, four are primarily programs that will help uh, livestock producers. Um, out, outside of those, many producers who have crops are gonna access uh, crop insurance through the Risk Management Agency, which is another division of USDA. So just a little bit more about some of the main programs that we use to help our producers. Uh, this is the Livestock Forage Disaster Program, and it is one of the first programs or one of the key programs that we use for most of our farmers and ranchers. Um, it's financial assistance to help them purchase hay. Um, they have to have, as a main qualifier, both livestock and grazing land to access this program. And, and this is triggered by, as I said, the U.S. Drought Monitor. So we pay close attention to that every week. Um, it's a county-by-county county trigger, so uh, that's important for our producers to know as well. And means that they do pay close attention to see what's going on with their county on that U.S. Drought Monitor. Oops. So this is another program, um, the Emergency Assistance for Livestock, Honeybees, and Farm-Raised Fish here in Nebraska. Uh, we're implementing this program right now uh, for our livestock producers in a couple of the different categories that you see here, um, helping them with the cost of transporting water. Um, if their stock pond has dried up, they may be transporting water when they normally wouldn't be. Um, 
So there's two new categories under this uh, since 2021. So we talked to producers and listened to producers about some of the things that they were having troubles with during drought. Um, and one of those things is not just purchasing hay, which is what I talked about with the livestock forage program, but it's also transporting that hay, right? So uh, maybe they're not able to grow as much of their own or, um, and they're still having to access hay, so they're having to bring it in from farther away and that gets very expensive. So um, we do have a component that helps financially reimburse them for part of the mileage for hauling that hay, um, as well as if they do it the other way, they're gonna move those animals to where there might be pasture available. So we'll help with the cost of moving those animals to that new location. Again, this uses the US Drought Monitor as a trigger. Ah, not doing very good with the clicker. There we go. Um, so the Conservation Reserve Program, Emergency Haying and Grazing Program, um, is another tool we use for our producers. It is a voluntary conservation program, for those of you who don't know, that takes environmentally sensitive land out of crop production and puts it into hay uh, or grasses and trees uh, for a longer term conservation effort. In times of drought, um, we do have this policy where we can allow producers to do some haying, grazing to help um, free up some more um, forage resources for our producers who might be struggling uh, when conditions are not very good for growing their own production. Um, there is a trigger through the U.S. Drought Monitor with this program as well. There's also the opportunity for um, bodies uh, called county committees. So these are county by county producers that are elected through Farm Service Agency to make some program decisions. Um, so it can be um, implemented through a county committee uh, action as well. And then I also wanted to note, I mentioned we also do some credit work uh, for producers. So we do have the emergency loan program that triggers with the disaster designation. Um, there's a drought disaster designation that triggers again with that US drought monitor. Um, and so this makes emergency loans available to producers um, to help them uh, access some financial resources um, if they're having trouble um, having enough money to to keep their operation going. Um, and then for current FSA customers, there's a disaster set aside. And so that's just allowing those customers to set aside a payment that um, they're gonna make to us. Uh, so freeing up some financial resources for them during times of drought uh, to put back into their operation. Uh, the key thing with both of these programs is that we are working with producers that already um, are having trouble so they can't get um, uh, financing through their own commercial um, options. So maybe their bank has decided not to work with them um, because they are in a, in a poor financial condition because of the current circumstances. And so we take a little bit bigger risk or have the ability to take a little bit bigger risk with those customers. Um, and then those were all farm bill programs that I was talking about. So those are regular programs that we operate. Um, uh, Congress has passed several ad hoc programs uh, through the years recently to help address drought um, circumstances. And so I've just mentioned here um, the emergency relief program is one of those um, where some additional money was approved by Congress. So from a producer and a standpoint and maybe even a mental health standpoint, you know, that extra infusion of dollars in different programs that they're not used to working with is something that comes into play or has come into the play last couple years um, to help them deal with the ongoing impacts of drought. Um, it's a good thing because there's more money coming in potentially that they weren't anticipating. Um, but sometimes it also can be challenging because it's a new program they don't recognize, new... Um, um, rules and regulations that they have to understand, new acronyms that they have to learn, all those things that can kind of uh, make a stressful situation even more stressful. But again, a good thing because it is helping with some additional financial resources that they maybe weren't expecting. So what happens when a producer comes in? Um, you know, I just mentioned a whole laundry list of potential programs, all these acronyms. It can get very uh, confusing sometimes. So we take a look and sit down with that producer and take a look at what all the tools are in our toolbox to help them. 
Um, we get this question all the time, what's triggered? If it hasn't triggered, a, a program isn't triggered in our county, when do we think it will trigger? Um, you know, all these programs have rules and regulations which, um, you know, for lack of better terminology, can create winners and losers. And so from a, a mental health or emotional standpoint, that can be tough too um, because, you know, somebody's going to not qualify, right? You know, I mentioned the livestock forage program has uh, one of the key qualifiers is you have to both have grazing animals and grazing land to qualify for that program. Well, what if I'm a producer who rents out my pasture? What kind of resource is there for me? I don't have the grazing animals, I don't own those animals, but yet I'm still being impacted by the drought. So all those programs have regulations that, again, create um, some you know, cutoff point and that can be challenging. And every producer situation is different and uh, it can get very emotional in our offices when that happens. Um, here's another thing to think about from our standpoint. We are local, we are rural. Our staffs live in the communities where they serve. They might have known these people that they're working with their whole entire lives. And so wanting to help is very personal, personal for that FSA employee because they are working with somebody that they likely care about very much. Um, and then also they're living what they are um, what they are helping their customers with too, because a lot of our employees are also farmers or ranchers themselves. So it can get very emotional and very stressful for them um, because it's very personal on a lot of different levels. So what we've done at Farm Service Agency is really worked on tra training for our staff uh, through online, uh, helping with stress management, helping them understand how to have difficult conversations with those customers, um, helping them understand maybe how to recognize the signs of uh, potential suicide um, so that they can find a way um, to figure out maybe what they need to do next to help that customer that's sitting across from them. We do some in-person practice. Um, we've found out that, you know, reading about it, learning about it uh, through these online sessions um, is not the same thing as maybe actually uh, sitting down and talking about it with um, each other and having those conversations to help prepare for when that producer maybe is sitting right across from them. Oops. Um, so I kind of covered this already. Um, so one of the last things I wanted to just to talk about is the Nebraska model. We do have a rural response hotline that was born in the 1980s in Nebraska. Um, due to the financial crisis at that time. It's funded through private uh, donations um, as well as some charitable donations and grants. Um, our Rural Response Council uh, runs it. Uh, they take, you know, basically phone calls from producers who are struggling. All of our county offices have these yellow cards that uh, is inset here sitting there and waiting um, so that we can slide that across to that producer if we feel like they are struggling to let them know that there's an option to receive some help. They can get a free mental health voucher or vouchers. So it's just a tool that we have in our county offices and here in Nebraska that I wanted to call attention to um, as a way for us to be able to help our customers. So with that, I believe my time is up and I am at my last slide. Okay, do we have any questions for Bobby? What county are you in? The question was, what county are you in? So I'm actually at the state office, so I help with communications and outreach for the whole state. Um, so I'm here in Lancaster County. Maybe time for one more question, if we have it. The question is, is there any data that's showing the, if there is a benefit to the programs um, that you're offering? I don't know that we've done any studies that correlate necessarily the amount of assistance that we're providing um, and how that maybe helps keep somebody in business who maybe would have went out of business. Um, I don't know that we've done any studies, at least through USDA on that. Probably somebody has, but I don't have that information in front of me. Thank you very much.
All right, so our next speaker is Dr. Laura Judd, and she is going to speak with us a little bit about NASA Earth observations and how those can be used to provide environmental data for this sort of research. Dr. Judd is a research physical scientist from NASA Langley Research Center in Hampton, Virginia, with expertise in interpreting air pollution from ground, aircraft, and satellite observations. She dedicates part of her time serving as an associate program manager for the Health and Air Quality Applications Program at NASA, where she helps manage a portfolio of health and air quality projects focused on the implementation of air quality standards, policy, and regulations for economic and human welfare. All right, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. All right. All right, my title slides up. Um, so I'll preface this talk that it's not necessarily focused on drought. The work that I do isn't necessarily drought related. Um, but instead, it's a focus on NASA Applied Sciences health and air quality uh, focus area, which has and will continue to enable research on environmental and human health, uh, including drought impacts, thanks to Jesse Bell and his team, uh, with a space-based view of our environment over the globe. Um, my area of expertise really is in the air quality route, uh, but drought as a subject was not completely foreign to me as um, Actually, it took me back to my last project here as a student at the University of Nebraska about a decade ago, where uh, we studied the impact of the 2012 drought on uh, land surfaces and uh, the atmosphere. So in my advanced remote sensing course, uh, we used data sets from multiple satellite platforms to investigate uh, the changes during the 2012 drought, which during Azar's talk, she showed this timeline over 20 years in Nebraska of uh, the severity of drought in 2012 to 2013 really sticks out there. Um, and so there's a link to the, the paper here uh, that, that was eventually put together after I had left and started my PhD in Houston, but I wanted to share here because it does connect with the subject at hand um, using uh, earth science data from NASA um, from the MODIS instrument, uh, which is a workhorse uh, and has been a workhorse over the last two decades, uh, to show how uh, the long, how long-term data compared to the anomalies of land surface temperature and vegetation um, in this case. And actually, it revealed the lack of anomalies um, in areas that were irrigated, um, which just shows the type of research studies that really require more than just information from satellites to fill. So I'm just talking about one part of the story here. We've heard a lot about other parts of the story. Um, and, and with that, so taking a look at NASA's Earth Science Fleet, um, this is, uh, we, we, we can view our environment from the satellite perspective, um, from about two dozen missions currently. So you can see in the blue icons and the green icons, those are instruments that are currently orbiting Earth, collecting uh, Earth science relevant data. And we have the warmer colors, oranges into the yellows going into the future, showing that we're continuing uh, this process here. Um, and many of these missions provide a lot of data sets um, relevant to health and air quality applications. I already showed land surface temperature and vegetation indices uh, as one example, but there are hundreds of other data sets ranging from fires, um, air quality emissions, rainfall, temperature, and more. Um, and the good news is, is that all these data sets are free and publicly available. Um, most of them you can find at earthdata.nasa.gov, um, and they're uh, supported by uh, about a dozen or so DACs around the country um, providing that data. However, just because it's free and publicly available doesn't mean it's always easy and simple to use. There are still barriers on, on integrating that data in. So this is where NASA Applied Sciences Program comes in uh, to lower these barriers for those that could use this data by supporting efforts on integrating NASA Earth data and tools for the benefit of decision makers. These efforts are centered around end users and stakeholder needs applying the most appropriate scientific methods to create solution-oriented applications. You can imagine the diversity of different organizations um, that could use NASA Earth data. I, I won't pretend to know them all. Um, but uh, so applied sciences is actually broken up into a, a multiple focus areas, including disasters, agriculture, um, water resources, and I'm in the health and air quality, and we have a couple of new areas, climate resilience and equity environmental justice that are, are coming on board. Um, so I sit in uh, 
the Health and Air Quality Applied Sciences Program, along with my team, our, our program manager, Mr. John Haynes, um, and then Helena Chapman and myself as his associates. And so our, our program supports the use of earth observations and air quality management in public health organizations specifically. Topics of focus span from air pollution, infectious diseases, vector-borne diseases, uh, climate change, and really any other topic where earth observations from satellites can help in characterizing the risk and mitigation strategies on, on health-related hazards. Um, so Jesse kind of gave a, a hint about the project that he's working on and linking droughts to respiratory health and, and thinking about air pollution effects there. And so um, we'll probably have some highlights in, in a future meeting about the su successes there. But I'll, I'll hit upon a couple projects um, in the program that kind of have not necessarily drought specific objectives, but drought adjacent in, in dust and, and extreme heat. Um, so this first project is led by Dr. Daniel Tong from George Mason University, and it's just about to wrap up. If it hasn't already, it's very close. Um, and it's motivated by the doubling of dust storm frequency in the southwestern U.S. since the 1990s, which has led to increased incidence of valley fever infections, um, highway accidents, and crop and property damages. But at the time he was starting his project, forecasting and surveillance activities um, had not routinely incorporated satellite observations at the appropriate spatial and temporal resolutions to really capture um, um, dust storms. Therefore, uh, Dr. Tong and his team developed a new data assimilation system that uses MODIS and GOES satellite data. Um, and, and in 2021, this was integrated into the National Air Quality Forecast Capability, NAQFC, which is the official um, air quality forecast that it is done by NOAA. Uh, this team also partnered with over 30 local, state, federal, and even international agencies to establish the Dust Alliance for North America, or DANA for short, which is an international initiative to accelerate transitioning dust sciences into services. A second project I, I would like to highlight is kind of a neat success related to extreme health that, that came out a few years ago. This is led by Tabassum Insoff from the New York State Department of Health in partnership with NOAA. Um, and, and I think it's not any surprise to anyone in the room that extreme temperatures cause negative health outcomes from as simple as just dehydration all the way down to respiratory um, impacts or, or even renal failure. Um, and, and with the help of NASA, um, sp NASA sponsored um, NLDAS system, the North American Land Data Assimilation System, uh, this team actually was able to find that negative health out outcomes actually rise before the stated heat advisory threshold back then of 100 degrees Fahrenheit um, in New York State. This led to New York State itself uh, lowering this defined temperature threshold to 95 degrees Fahrenheit with the hope of mitigating some of the negative impacts, allowing people to take action um, before you get that rise in, in those negative um, outcomes. So the two projects that I, I talked about were kind of more of our standard projects that, that um, typically last about three years with very specific goals, um, a team that, that consists of scientific researchers and stakeholders um, working toward achieving, uh, integrating NASA data into decision-making frameworks of the partner organizations. Um, but our program also supports kind of a unique type of team uh, called the Health and Air Quality Applied Sciences Team, or HACAST. HACAST is a collaborative team that works in partnership with public health and air quality agencies across the globe to use NASA data and tools for public benefit. Uh, this team is in its third generation, so it's, it's been around for over a decade. It's recompeted every four to five years. Um, and we're right in the middle of the, th the third generation, which runs from 2021 to 2025. Um, there are 14 uh, PIs that, are, that compose this team with expertise that span from air quality, urban heat islands, light pollution, fires, et cetera. Um, and, and each of these PIs has a specific project that with the stakeholder that they're working on with a specific objective that lasts over the four years. But what's unique about HACAST is actually um, an effort, a, a tiger team efforts that are uh, selected on, they're, they're about 18 month to two year projects. Um, and what they do, or what they are, are short-term, high-impact collaborative efforts between HACAST members and public stakeholders to identify and solve critical problems in a more timely fashion than, say, a normal NASA solicitation where you might have to wait around for three years before they list it for that, something that's relevant to you. So it kind of gives you a, an in that way. 
Um, so to find out more about Haycast, you can visit their website. I got a QR code, but it's just haycast.org. Um, and and there, there are ways to that people can get involved as soon as possible. Um, by uh, there's, there's public meetings every six months. They're hybrid. Um, and the next one is in October in Salt Lake City. So if anyone's intrigued and wants to go, the previous meetings are also, the presentations are at least online. Um, so that may be something you could check out and see if that's something that might fit within the realm of what you're all working on um, so we can uh, create a larger collaboration. Um, so for the last part of this talk, I wanted to talk about um, some exciting updates with some upcoming missions that have recently launched. Uh, in December, NASA, in collaboration with CNES, the French Space Agency, as well as partnership with the Canadian Space Agency and the UK Space Agency, launched SWAT, which stands for Surface Wa Water and Ocean Topography. SWAT will provide the most detailed global survey of NASA's surface water to date, uh, seeing lakes down to 250 meter resolution and rivers as wide as um, 100 or as small as 100 meters, and how they change over time with a 21-day repeat cycle over the lifetime of the mission. Um, so I, I am not a water expert uh, or a water remote sensing expert, but I can only imagine how there would be applications relevant to, to drought research uh, with, with that mission. And then just in the last month, on April 7th, NASA launched TEMPO, which stands for Tropospheric Emissions Monitoring of Pollution. Um, and it's the first geostationary air quality satellite observing over greater North America with capabilities nominally to scan from the East Coast to the West Coast every hour during the daytime, measuring emissions um, such as nitrogen dioxide um, and another precursor, near-surface ozone precursors to near-surface ozone, including formaldehyde uh, and aerosols. And th these will be captured at the highest spatial resolution that's been available um, than, than what's been available before from satellites, and uh, for the first time every hour. Um, Tempo's not alone up there, and thinking globally, because we're in geostationary, you're kind of stuck looking at one region. Um, but uh, so it's not alone providing that bird's eye view of chemical weather, but a global constellation of these geostationary sensors are coming to fruition across the northern, northern hemisphere, which makes it a really exciting time, at least in the, the air quality world, uh, with satellite uh, data. So our, our South Korean colleagues launched GEMS in 2020, um, and it's been successfully measuring the last three years over East Asia. And Sentinel-4 will be launching by our, launched by our European colleagues next year. And all these data sets, while it doesn't measure the whole globe, there are global measurements of these types that kind of from, from low Earth orbiting satellites that can interweave these different domains, as well as pr provide data in other places. Um, Looking ahead at one mission that we're really excited about, particularly in the health and air quality program, is Maya, or the Multi-Angle Imager for Aerosols, which is the first mission that, was jointly, that has been jointly developed between NASA researchers and epidemiologists and public health organizations. Um, and so with the launch aimed currently in late 2024, uh, Maya, Maya's observing strategy is more targeted. It's going to target um, a couple dozen places on the globe that have ongoing health studies um, that link aerosol composition to impacts on health. Um, so that's something really exciting to look forward to in the future. Um, just one final slide um, as a final topic before I wrap up. For those of you that are, have not used satellite data and maybe are looking to learn more about what's available or maybe just some basic training on how you might get started, um, the, the Applied Sciences program also um, has RSET, which is the Advanced Remote Sensing Training. And this, this program sits within capacity building in the uh, Applied Sciences program, and it provides freely available trainings, both in person and online, as well as previous trainings. You can go walk yourself through these trainings to learn along the way. Um, I actually take them myself sometimes uh, in, in areas that I'm not necessarily um, an expert in. So when, when they have a SWAT one, that might be something I'll, I'll sit in on. Um, but it does start from the fundamentals and then goes to more specific, such as air quality linking with uh, health exposure assessment or using satellite data for urban heat island analysis. Um, so that's all today. Uh, I really appreciate your attention. I'm happy to take questions, and I'll be around today if, if people want to take questions offline as well, because I know I went over time. Thank you.
There might be time for one question if anyone has one. Yes. Okay, yes, we'll ha we should have time here at the end. A question for Laura? Okay, thank you so much. All right, so the last presentation uh, was put together by Rachel Lukadu, who is an assistant professor in the epidemiology department of the College of Public Health at the University of Nebraska Medical Center. As I mentioned earlier, unfortunately, she is on jury duty, so is not able to present, but I am going to do my best to present the presentation for her. I have been working very closely with her and Jesse on this work, so hopefully I will be able to do it some justice. Um, so I will be talking about the work that's been going on to engage with public health and other stakeholders around the topic of drought and health over the last few years. So this project uh, between Jesse's team and NIDIS, which is the National Integrated Drought Information System, which is the program that I work for, um, started back in 2019. And really the goal of this project is to engage, like I said, with stakeholders that work in this topic area. Um, so we wanted to start to engage these partners from the public health um, field, as well as the climate community, to talk about the topic of drought and health. And some of the goals that we had for this project were to share the current state of knowledge on drought and health, and also to really identify what the gaps and needs are related to this work. When we are trying to think about how we can better prepare for those impacts of health um, or impacts from drought on health, what can we do to actually reduce our risk moving forward? And so the uh, idea behind this is to also start to develop a community of practice that's working in this space that is a mix of stakeholders from both the public health side as well as the community, um, the climate community to address these needs. So I'll be talking a little bit about how we approach this work over the last few years. And um, so as I mentioned, we had a variety of different partners that we were engaging with this, um, with this effort including the public health and healthcare preparedness community, as well as emergency management, and also the communities that are impacted. And so we talked with these different stakeholders and also the climate community to come up with um, you know, the needs and gaps related to this topic. The approach that we took were, was through meetings, regional workshops, and also individual interviews and surveys. So first, I wanted to talk about the National Summit. Um, which took place in the summer of 2019 in Atlanta. And so this was done in partnership between NIDIS and the University of Nebraska Medical Center, but also we had partnerships with CDC, the National Integrated Heat Health Information System. As you've heard, obviously there is a correlation between drought and heat and how those impacts together can worsen the health impacts, and other partners that you see here on this screen. So um, the topics that were discussed at this summit are listed here on the slide. And so there was a, a, um, a focus on water quality and quantity, heat, air quality, and also disease. And we wanted to look at this through the lens of vulnerable populations and also state, local, and tribal health departments. And so I don't know exactly how many people attended. If, do you remember? over 50 people. Um, so some of the outcomes from this meeting, which again was a mix of presentations, but also engaging with the people that came to this summit to talk through what are the gaps and needs related to this. Um, so those are listed here on the slide, and we'll talk a little bit more as we look at the regional workshops too on what some of the outstanding needs are related to communication and education, data and indicators, coordination, and building collaboration overall between these groups. So uh, after the summit, the national summit, we decided that we wanted to do regional workshops to really get at the needs at the re regional level, which is an approach that NIDIS takes with all of our drought work. And so we have drought early warning systems across the country. I coordinate our Midwest and Missouri River Basin um, drought early warning systems. And so we did these workshops across some of our various regions. Um, starting in late 2019 in the Midwest, uh, in St. Paul, and also right before COVID in Tucson, and then as you can imagine, COVID had an impact on our ability to do these regional workshops. So 
We had a virtual workshop in, for the Carolinas in September 2020. And then we did get back to in-person workshops uh, last year, starting in the Missouri River Basin in Bozeman in April of 2022, and then just most recently in October in Portland, o Oregon, looking at the Pacific Northwest. So as you can imagine, um, all of these regional workshops, the intent was to really get at the regional needs and the topics that matter for these different areas. And so how we developed these regional workshops were to find local partners that are able to help us bring in the right people for each of the regions so that we can have a committee that really is getting at an agenda that's targeted to that region. And we also wanted to make sure that we had diversity with our practitioners that we were having at these workshops. And so in general, the format was um, an introduction to drought and health, and then also a drought 101, because we didn't want to assume everyone knows exactly you know, all the specifics of drought. Um, and then we had a blend of panel and plenary discussions, and also we had some facilitated discussions to get at the gaps and needs. So finally, as I mentioned, COVID had an impact on our ability to have these regional workshops, which was really our opportunity to engage with these partners. And so in the meantime, while we were waiting to resume in-person workshops, um, UNMC did some interviews um, in order to find out what those needs are with public health departments. So there were 16 interviews that were um, conducted across the US, and some of the common concerns related to drought and health were private unregulated wells, data availability, and also the recreational water use and availability. So what are we doing with all of this information? So really the end goal of having these engagements and establishing what the needs are was to develop a drought and health roadmap document. And the purpose of this roadmap, doc roadmap document is to lay out the needs and gaps that we heard from on the ground related to drought and health. And so this document actually will be released this week, finally. I wish that I had copies here to hand out to everyone, but uh, we are releasing it this week and it will be available on drought.gov. And it really will help to inform future health-related activities with my program, NIDIS, and also other federal agencies and other programs that are working in this space. And so some of the primary um, actions that are, that are identified in here um, are to continue to build the community of practice that's working on this topic so that we can build case studies and other efforts and share that information with one another as we do address this issue. We're hoping that this document will also help to guide um, monetary support with federal and state entities that really are looking to make some changes to address this issue. So again, if you're interested in getting a copy of this report when it's released this week, um, it will be available on drought.gov, but also feel free to come see me and I can make sure that you are on our email list. I believe that is it. So. I think we have a couple minutes for questions if anyone has them. Yes, um, I wish I had the roadmap document in front of me. Do you? Yeah, yeah. So um, I do think the community of practice is a big one of continuing to build that. Um, there's, I don't, Jesse, do you want to speak to this at all since you guys? pulled it together. Sure. All right, how about now? <laughs> oh, okay. Um, uh, so there were a number of different, oh. Oh, um, so what were some of the findings from the, the document? Um, there are a number of different findings. I'll, I'll put it that way. So I'll try to summarize as much as possible. Um, one, as Molly said within there, there was a number of different concerns. Uh, it was actually, uh, one, the private wells was a huge issue that came up time and time again, no matter where, at, where you're at in the United States. Private wells associated with drought and the public health implications associated with that. It's more with water availability, but water quality is also a potential challenge within that. Um, and then a number of other issues as well. Um, and then when we're talking about what is actually should be done with this, or what were some of the findings that came from this, community of practice. And so when drought events occur, 
having public health officials understand that there is a, a platform that they can go to to understand what's going on, how to better communicate with each other, and lessons learned to be able to be shared between different uh, health officials so that that's uh, not just sitting in one state or one location. Um, what else do we have? And along those lines, there is a need to develop more communication outreach materials on what are the ties. So I think one thing that we found is that a lot of public health departments don't, they are not aware of the ties between drought and health impacts in their community. So having some sort of communication document outreach material that's ready to go um, to share with those public health departments was definitely a big finding as well. Um, and I thought of another one and it slipped my mind. So. Oh. Well, and that there's still a lot of research as well. Yeah. Uh, understanding some of these relationships is still at the very infant stage, and so we need to do a lot more work to try to understand and develop some of these relationships moving forward, and that some of the relationships are very region-specific, and so that we need to do more work in, those, in that regard as well. And I got a text message from Rachel saying that she just got out of jury, <laughs> whatever, summons. So Darn. Yeah. <laughs> and if she was here, she would do a much better job of, of articulating yes. this. Yes, I, and then it came back to me and then it left again. So obviously my brain is doing a great job today. Um, what was it? Uh, I don't remember. If I think of it, I will let you know. <laughs> Sorry about that. Any other questions? Yes. You know what, can I just have you use the microphone so I don't have to, you don't have to start over, but if you want to just, <laughs> all right. This question's for Dr. Abadi, and she did some really fine work regarding the relationship between uh, suicide and drought, and what you see with gun violence versus non-gun violence as the cause of that suicide. But I fail to see the in-depth work that we have had in this country for years, and I use the Pacific Northwest as an example. And it's even a board question on medical boards, the relationship between uh, light exposure, which you see in the Pacific Northwest with increased rain and increased rates of depression. So is that kind of research coming or done, or are we still waiting for that? Because I didn't see causative factors, I just noted on the graphs, hey, there's an increased rate of su suicide with droughts, but I didn't see any, any relationship to see what that actual causative factor is. Well, thank you so much for that question. That was a great question, yes. Um, unfortunately, with this data set that we had, it was a very coarse resolution on a monthly level, and uh, suicide is a very complex issue. <laughs> so we couldn't work with the causal inference uh, methodologies, but uh, we are in the process of putting together, you know, like a high resolution data set, so we can actually talk about different risk factors like, uh, you know, like if they have been exposed to, for example, pesticide, you know, like in those counties, how it changes. Or we have seen a pattern that we have higher suicides in the mountainous region of Rocky Mountains. And uh, so elevation might be a factor on that. Occupation is a big factor on that if they are, you know, like relying on the, you know, like on the land for, you know, like sustainable living. Um, yeah, but it's coming. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you for that question. Yeah, and th that is, it's, it's incredibly complicated. And like Dr. Abadi said, you know, we're, we're hoping to push continuously forward with that. But one of the other things is, you know, we've started to look at this a little bit. And so the, well, kind of. And so the study that was published by Jesse Berman, I was one of the co-authors on that, that was just looking at occupational stress. And so it was self-documented, like the, the, it was a survey that went out to farmers throughout the Midwestern part of the United States. And the farmer, 
would it was more for occupational hazards and risk and so the farmer could report you know i injured my elbow or i injured this or that but within there there was self-reported stress and we saw an increase in self-reported stress in farmers during the 2012 drought and when you looked at the growing season versus non-growing season, that's where we saw the significance. And so it really does get back to a little bit of, you know, that's obviously not suicide, uh, but it is showing some of those relationships with the stress and where some of that potential stress is coming from on the farmer as well, especially during that growing season period. Okay, we do have an online question. Um, so in reference to the issue of mental health, drought and suicide, I am wondering how public messaging and pre-planning about this issue can help with resources to address and help those and their families through these severe droughts before a cause of death of suicide occurs. So suicide is stigmatized and in rural communities it is a tough situation to address. So any thoughts on that? So I would just say, like in Nebraska, we do have, as I noted, the Rural Response Hotline um, that does provide mental health vouchers, free mental health vouchers for producers. So, you know, if there is an opportunity to talk about um, donations or assistance for, for instance, again, that's a local resor resource and response, but, you know, a way to support that Rural Response Hotline is something that producers can access during times of stress. Um, one of the things that um, the folks who run that hotline have told me is that they do see a significant increase in requests for mental health vouchers during times of drought. And I specifically asked her that before I came here. And she's seeing right now 300 to 400 vouchers a month going out the door for producers here in Nebraska to help with some counseling um, related to their stress. And she was connecting it to the drought and where we're at right now in Nebraska going into the growing season. So financial resources for that entity and then if something can be replicated, I would say in other locations. And I'm sure other states maybe do have something similar, but that's just an example from here in Nebraska. Yeah, and I'll add to that. That's what I was thinking of is that is definitely the topic of mental health and knowing that there are some examples out there of states or, you know, it, extension programs that have resources available, making it known across different areas what some examples are on how to provide um, relief, you know, or resources. So that is definitely something that I think those, you know, best practices can be shared a lot more broadly through a community of practice, so. I would say the other thing she told me is that one of the things COVID taught us um, was the ability to do telehealth more and for producers that don't want to go to their local provider because of the stigma. They don't want their pickup to be seen in front of their mental health counselor in town. Um, they're now more able to get those resources from somebody else outside of their immediate area and feel more comfortable accessing those resources. So I have a question for Bobby. Um, so there were lots of tools that farmers could uh, realistically access if they're in a drought. Now, is there an expectation of learning? So hypothetically, for example, if today, if um, those programs are triggered by moderate drought, is there an expectation that in five to 10 years, it'll trigger at a severe drought, not at moderate drought, because the expectation is that farmers would have changed um, their practices by now to accommodate the changes in climate? I guess I don't know um, whether I could see the program regulations changing to um, um, force those producers to make those changes, but there are a number of programs that do incent them to make those changes so that they don't have a severe impact. So um, ECP was on the list. It's called um, Emergency Conservation Program. That helps producers um, potentially put in um, a better watering system into their pasture. 
Um, there's opportunities through um, our partner called the Natural Resource Conservation Service, also a part of USDA, to incent producers to put in cross fencing in their pastures so that they use more of a rotational grazing system. So um, I guess what I'm telling you, and, and even right now through um, the current administration, they are encouraging climate smart agriculture practices and incenting producers to do types of activities that are gonna allow them to be more resilient and to be able to overcome droughts in the future um, through you know, putting cover crops on their ground. Um, again, I said cross fencing and pasture rotation, those types of things that will make them more resilient. So I think USDA is doing a lot in that sphere to encourage um, better management practices for producers. Does anyone else want to address or do you have a question? Okay, one second. Let me. Hello, my question's for Dr. Judd. Um, you briefly mentioned, this is sort of a broad question, but you briefly mentioned that your um, agency is focusing more on equity and environmental justice. And so I was just wondering what that looked like for you. All right, thanks. Yeah. Um, so. I, I know this answer more in the realm of, of air quality and air pollution, uh, as that's been a popular uh, subject in my program. Um, so there's actually, so the Applied Sciences pro Program noticed that there was this jump in wanting to use earth observations to look at equity and environmental justice issues related to pollution. It could be also green space in cities or, um, other topics, I'm sure I'm blinking. <laughs> um, and, and so they started a new program area. They have, they selected, I think it's like 40 different projects um, that have different timelines of six months to a year and they're just getting started in the last couple months. Um, prior to the starting of this program at, in the health and air quality, we, we have a few uh, projects that have been looking at environmental justice. Uh, in particular, I'll highlight with HACAST um, and that Tiger Team effort. Um, and, and recognizing the importance of identifying issues in relation to uh, environmental justice and, and recognizing that there are tools out there by say the EPA or CDC um, that do exist but don't necessarily take advantage of the satellite perspective that it can provide. Um, there was a tiger team uh, led by Dr. Susan Annenberg and Dr. Uh, Chien Zhao, Zhao um, that worked on getting some of these data sets into EP, EPA, is it EJ screen, um, and, and some of the state environmental justice portals that, that are there. Um, and, and that actually was reselected for funding to continue going because they have so much momentum. So they're actually working on an RSET training now, and I mentioned RSET, to, on how um, these data sets can go in. Um, and so it's just trying to provide that, that kind of low-hanging fruit. There's a satellite data there. It's hard to use. Um, and so these experts in using that data are working with the partners that are trying to provide that information. Do we have any other questions? Yes. Thank you. Uh, I actually have a comment <coughs> and then a question, that question that dates back to when Jesse was up there. Uh, the comment I'd like to share with you is I really appreciate what y'all are doing in the area of mental health and looking at stress. Um, I grew up in the south central part of Nebraska, and my father, I watched my father struggle with the stresses of farming, and I know it's real. I know it's significant. But the, the, the really impact of stress really didn't hit me until I commanded troops in Iraq, and I lost a soldier in Iraq from bad decision making, risky behavior, not suicide, just the impacts of stress and how it can lead to making bad decisions. And I would encourage you to expand your data collection into that area of identifying when stress is impacting decision making processes that lead to other health related uh, issues. Um, so that's the comment I have. Now the question I have is, and I really appreciated last slide, you had up Rachel's slides where you talked about valley fever, and this is something, Jesse, uh, and probably also Laura, um, I've had questions about 
us diving deeper into predictive values uh, for when weather starts to change adaptive ranges for both disease vectors, but also the diseases themselves. And valley fever, there's been a lot written lately about how it's expanding its range, protect, protect, excuse me, potentially gonna impact both animals and, and people. Is this something that we should be investing in more to look at how do we get out ahead of that? Rather than being reactive, as one of you very eloquently stated, we're not good at proactive, we're very reactive. Is this something we should be looking at for expansion of, of infectious disease threats? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in first on that. Yeah, 100%, um, 100%. They, you know, you, you, valley fever is a perfect example. And for those that aren't familiar with valley fever, it's a fungal pathogen. It's in the desert southwest region of the United States. It also goes down into Mexico and, and South America as well. Um, this fungal pathogen has a direct association with drought, dry periods. And so as the soils dry out, the uh, soil can, if it's disturbed, get a, in, and, and when it's disturbed, then you have dust, and then somebody can breathe in that dust, and if that soil particle is present, or that fungal particle is present, it gets into your lungs, and it can cause um, uh, health issues associated with a wide variety of health issues as well. And we have been seeing these, this fungal pathogen in places that previously didn't occur. Uh, one of the recent uh, identifications. I actually worked within CDC within the mycotics diseases branch and I remember when they first discovered that they found what was traditionally it was only found the endemic region was in the southwestern region. Uh, Arizona, California are two of the highest prevalent states. But then all of a sudden they saw it up in Washington and they saw a uh, occurrence of it there. And uh, there's also been reports here in Nebraska where they have now seen uh, cases of valley fever and there's no known transmission from the Southwest because it, people do go down there, contract the disease and then bring it back to their, their home state. But there's a couple cases where they don't see that transmission so it might be locally prevalent now. And there was a researcher named Morgan Gorris who did some work around this. She's at Los Alamos National Lab um, and I've worked with her on some things before that did a predictive model of where we could potentially see valley fever in the future. And Nebraska was one of those places, even though there wasn't, it was the conditions were right with drought and other things that could potentially make that uh, possible here. And so yeah, we need to do a lot more work because valley fever is just one example, but we have tons of different diseases that are out there. And then as we're seeing changes in our environment, especially, you know, for example, in the western part of the United States, and I, you know, Mark was here, Mark Savota from NDMC, and I know his group has done some work looking at West Nile disease and the association with drought as well. When we're looking at this, if we're not identifying those relationships with the change in environment now, we're not gonna understand it or be prepared to understand it in the future. And that is one of the unfortunate parts of, of the healthcare system within the United States. And I'm not trying to dog on it in any, well, well, maybe a little bit here, but um, <laughs> when you look at how much we spend in the United States on health, only about one to 3% is on public health. And that's prevention. So one to 3% of what we spend in the United States is on prevention. So just a very small fraction of that. And then how much of that are we spending on understanding those relationships with environment and environmental change, even a much smaller fraction of that. So we need to be doing a lot more work on understanding some of these changes. And I think that's where some of this new satellite data products that are coming in, like Tempo, that gives us even better uh, quantification of changes in our environment here in, in the United States. So I think we have the opportunity, we have the expertise, we just need to make sure we're having the resources. I don't know if anybody else. So following up on the Valley Fever, right? How do you see global partnerships that could speed up the process of seeing the prevention here in the US 
when you are partnering and collaborating with countries that already have these issues and already have set up, have in place things that could benefit us. So how can we learn from them and not just start on the wheel again? Do you, you want to jump in quickly? Well, I, I mean, I gave the one example in, in the, the Valley Fever specific one with Dana um, that, that did grow out of a workshop that, that came about and recognizing the need, like, hey, we want to transition the dust sciences and the services. Um, and, and so I actually, I don't know if I, I think it's one of the things that we struggle with is growing and recognizing and talking to each other. Um, I, I seem to, ever, ever since COVID has happened though, I have seen that there, it's almost been, been have, having all the virtual connections makes it a little bit easier, but we still need to learn as humans how to communicate with each other. And, and we're all so busy, so that, that, that's really a struggle. Um, but at least with, um, in, in the, the public health uh, part of things. Um, I, my colleagues, Helena Chapman and John Haynes, uh, along with a NOAA colleague, lead a community of practice related to health. Um, and it includes areas like air quality and extreme temperatures and whatnot. And I, I, they've just seen that, that group boom. And, and it's all international. They tried to change, I, well, they haven't changed the time in the meetings for in a while, but. Um, <laughs> I, and so I think if you're wanting to grow, that's another thing. If you're wanting to grow in other areas um, and working with countries around the world, it's recognizing that everybody has their own schedule. And maybe if you're trying to grow in that area, you should accommodate somebody, um, have, have a late night meeting in the U.S. and, and be accommodating and, and recognizing that you need to, to do that. that. It's just a challenge. But does anybody else have any? I, I, Bobby, do you have something? And I'll, I'll add to this, but in especially around drought and health. I, you know, it was really interesting. So back when I was at CDC, and people knew that I was working on drought. And I, I've told a number of people this in the past. People knew that I was working at drought, on drought and CDC. And I was running a joint position between NOAA and CDC. And so do you, you, most of you or some of you probably remember when Cape Town was running out of water, right? And... It was fascinating because people were looking for materials to try to help share with the, the community there in South, in South Africa and trying to figure out how to better communicate around the health issues that are facing associated with drought. And so I got two requests within roughly a week of each other coming from both entities. And so one came up all the way through uh, uh, the World Meteorological Organization over to NOAA to me looking for materials that could potentially be talk about how drought impacts human health, especially internationally. And then there was another one that came up through the World Health Organization through CDC to me. And it was basically people were in a mad rush to figure out what kind of information could be shared and talked about. And it made me realize that we need to do a lot more work, especially internationally, developing some of these materials. And I think that's where some of the work that we're doing here, and I, I think it goes both ways, and communication always needs to go both ways. We're doing a lot of good work. So you saw like the uh, roadmap that Molly presented on. Obviously that's US focused, but there's still good information that could be used and shared internationally and reformatted internationally as well. But then there's also a lot of things, because we didn't really tap in we tried at the early part, but we didn't tap into a lot of what was going on internationally around drought and health. And you look at places like Africa and Australia and other places around, they have done a lot of work for a long time looking at it. And so I think, yeah, we just need to do a better job. That's like the, the end of the, the, the story is that we just need to do a better job of doing more communication around these efforts. Because we're data, we are, we're, we, can, we are somewhat data rich here in the United States, so we can find some of these relationships, but they're also experience rich in other parts of the world that can allow us to understand how to implement it better, so, and vice versa. All right, well, we are four minutes over, so I think we need to I'm sorry, we have to wrap up. Thank you again so much, everyone, and thank you for your attendance.